Hey, how's it going, everyone? My name is Jason Sounds, and welcome to episode two of my learning sound design series. In the last episode, we went over a lot of the fundamentals of sound, and if you haven't watched that yet, I highly recommend you go back and check it out before moving on to this episode, as all of these concepts build on each other. In this episode, we will be taking a look at the harmonic series, different types of synthesis, and get introduced to oscillators. Just a quick reminder that all these videos are being released completely for free right here on YouTube. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider joining the Patreon or becoming a YouTube member. Also, feel free to check out some of the presets on my website or make a donation with PayPal. All links are in the description. Thanks so much for your support. Whenever you listen to a sound, there are two main components. Tonal and noise. The way we distinguish between these is that sounds with at least one discernible pitch are considered tonal, and everything else falls into the noise category. Some examples of sounds that are mostly or entirely tonal are bird song, a creaking door, or a square wave. Some examples of sounds that are noise-based are a river, a shaker, or footsteps. Just about all organic instruments, and even some synth sounds, have a large noise component in addition to their tonal component. Think of a piano. Have you ever wondered what a piano would sound like without its tonal component? Take a listen. Pretty weird, right? Or how about this bell? Now with only its tonal component. Making this distinction and being able to pull apart sounds in your head like this is a pretty advanced skill and one that takes some time to learn. For the foreseeable future, we will be focusing predominantly on the tonal aspect of sounds, so you don't need to worry too much about this yet. However, I still encourage you to try breaking sounds apart in your head in this way. It's an interesting mental exercise, and when we get into physical modeling way down the road, being able to make this distinction will pay off. But in the meantime, what exactly makes us perceive something as having a pitch? The answer to this question is more complex than you might think. We learned about sine waves in episode one, so let's start with one of those. Here we can see that this sine wave is playing at 440 Hz, which is equivalent to the pitch of A4. But now, watch what happens when I add a second sine wave playing at twice this value, which is 880 Hz. How about three times this value, at 1320 Hz? Four times? And we can just keep going with this all the way to the top of the audible range. You might have noticed that although there are hundreds of sine waves all playing at different frequency values, we only interpret this sound as playing at the pitch of our original sine wave. We can even mute our original sine wave, and our brain will still perceive this as playing at the pitch of where that sine wave should be. This natural phenomenon is known as the harmonic series, and all these sine waves that make it up are known as harmonics. This first harmonic here is known as the fundamental, and all these higher harmonics are multiples of the fundamental frequency. The fundamental is the perceived pitch a sound has. A piano playing at the pitch of A4 will have its fundamental at 440 Hz. The frequency mess you see down here is just noise from the piano's hammer. Our brain doesn't process these harmonics as separate pitches, instead, it just interprets them as being part of the fundamental frequency. If I play a chord of A minor, we now have three fundamental frequencies, A, C, and E, and each of these fundamentals contains their own harmonic series. Also, when the fundamental changes, the harmonics follow it. Look at the synth sound, which contains the first four harmonics. As the fundamental changes, the harmonics remain locked in a consistent ratio to it. The reason it starts to get a little warped like this is due to our frequency analyzer's visual decay settings. The harmonics aren't actually getting wider or occupying more frequencies. What we are looking at here is a different kind of spectrum view, known as a spectrogram, and it is a great way to better visualize some of the concepts we just talked about. It is like waveform view in the sense that we can see the future and past of the signal, but instead of the waveform, it shows us the frequency content in the audible range, just like spectrum view. Down here we have 20 Hz, and at the top we have 20,000 Hz. These bold lines are the harmonics. Here I have that synth sample we just pulled up.
We can see that as the fundamental raises its frequencies, the harmonics follow it. Remember that creaking door sound? We can witness the same thing happening there as well. Over here the pitch drops as the door opens, and then we have this noisy section in the middle where there is no discernible pitch, and then here at the end it becomes tonal again as the door closes. Not every sound has every single harmonic. A big part of what makes sounds unique is the harmonics they choose to display. Some sounds might have only a few harmonics. Some sounds might have many harmonics. Some sounds might have harmonics that change over time. Even though all these sounds were playing at the same pitch, or in other words, had the same fundamental frequency, they still sound different because of their noise components and their harmonics. Think about a flute versus a guitar. A flute only has the first few harmonics paired with that airy breath noise. A guitar, on the other hand, has much less noise but contains a much larger portion of the harmonic series. This unique character a sound has is known as its timbre. The actual definition of timbre is the character or quality of a musical sound or voice as distinct from its pitch and intensity. And by intensity here, it really just means volume. As sound designers, this is what we do. We operate in this domain of timbre. You aren't going to invent a new pitch or chord or volume level that no one has ever created before. But just about every time you've opened a synthesizer, after you've turned a few knobs and added a couple of effects, you're in all likelihood working with a timbre that no one has ever come across before. That's just how statistics work when you have this many moving parts. When it comes to noise and harmonic spread, there are an infinite number of possibilities. And in my opinion, timbre and sound design have the largest role to play in the future of music. We are at a point where we can digitally recreate pianos, flutes, guitars, and just about any instrument that you can think of. Now that we are no longer constrained by physical materials and the laws of nature when it comes to creating sound, there's nothing stopping you from creating the next saxophone, piano 2.0, or breaking onto the scene with some unheard of genre. With that being said, let's move on to part two. There are a few main types of synthesis you should know about. The ones I'm going to go over here are sample-based, additive, and subtractive. The first kind, sample-based synthesis, is based entirely on pre-recorded sounds. You might have heard of a sampler, where you start with a recording, and it is resampled across the span of the keyboard. This technique is really good for things like vocal chops. Another kind of sample-based synthesizer is known as a rompler, where in every preset, each key is mapped to a different variation of the same sound, hence where the ROM part comes from. These are generally less customizable and entirely preset-based. You aren't able to start with your own recordings like you can in a sampler. These were really popular in the 2012 era, but now are generally looked down on and known for their high space requirements and oftentimes lower quality sounds. However, some romplers are done really well, and this type of sample-based synthesis really shines from working with recordings of real instruments. Think of Keyscape or contact libraries. A final kind of sample-based synthesis that I'm especially fond of is granular synthesis. This takes a starting sample and duplicates it over time. You can also set each duplication to be at a different position within the stereo field, play for varying amounts of time, or even at different pitches. The best way to understand this is just to hear it for yourself. Next up we have additive synthesis, which involves starting with the fundamental and adding harmonics. Additive synthesis isn't super common, but it has a really unique sound to it that you've probably heard before. Also in this vein is frequency modulation synthesis, or FM synthesis, which involves changing the pitch of the fundamental really quickly in a way that introduces new harmonics. You can also use FM synthesis on sounds that have many harmonics to begin with. And now as we quickly change the pitch of each of these harmonics, they each individually generate new harmonics of their own. You can get some very loud and abrasive sounds using this method. <laughs> Finally, we have subtractive synthesis, which is the most common and versatile form of synthesis. This involves starting with more harmonically rich sources in the form of oscillators, and using things like filters and effects to shape your sound. This is the kind of synthesis that we will be mainly focusing on in this series. When it comes to subtractive synthesis, you can think of it like making a sculpture. You start with a big chunk of clay and slowly chip away at it until you create a work of art. 
Here, our clay is known as oscillators, the starting point for creating just about any sound imaginable. We have different kinds of clay to work with, depending on the sound we are looking to create. And we sculpt, cut, combine, and polish this clay until we get the sound we are looking for. Remember waveform view from episode 1? This is where the term oscillator comes from. The speaker is being told to oscillate back and forth through positive and negative polarity. Remember, the zero line is in the middle, not the bottom. Oscillators are made to play little pieces of waveforms, otherwise known as wave shapes, and different wave shapes activate different harmonics. They are typically represented visually as just an individual cycle, but when we hold down a key, they will repeat at the frequency we tell them to until they are told to stop or change frequency. I'd recommend going back to our talk on frequency in episode 1 if you find this confusing. There are a few basic shapes that are famous throughout subtractive synthesis, and I'm a firm believer that you can create just about any sound imaginable by skillfully using these four basic waveforms. So without further ado, here they are. Up first, we have a sine wave which you were introduced to in episode 1. The sine wave is the most basic waveform shape possible as it contains only the fundamental harmonic. But that doesn't mean sine waves aren't useful. In fact, quite the opposite. I'd even go so far as saying that sine waves are my favorite waveform. Since every waveform, and every possible sound for that matter, can be recreated using sine waves, the possibilities here are quite literally limitless. Next up here we have the triangle wave. The triangle wave contains only odd harmonics that get progressively quieter as they get farther away from the fundamental. Triangle waves are useful when you want something a little bit brighter than a sine wave. You hear them a lot in bell sounds. Now here we have the square wave. It contains every odd harmonic playing at an equal amplitude. It is very bright and you commonly hear it used in genres such as future bass. And last but not least we have the saw wave. The saw wave is arguably the most famous waveform and I guarantee you've heard it in almost every song you've ever listened to. It contains every single harmonic playing at an equal amplitude. From basses, to pads, to leads, Saw waves are used everywhere, all the time. In the same way that a combination of sine waves can be used to create all other waveforms, since a saw wave contains all the harmonics, every single possible waveform exists somewhere within it. This is sort of the fundamental idea behind additive versus subtractive synthesis. Okay, I know that this is a lot to take in, but this really is important information that the entire series will build on. Having a thorough understanding of what we are talking about right now will pay off big time down the road. So my first homework assignment is that if you don't fully understand something that we went over, go back over it and explore it some more. Read some Wikipedia articles or look up some other videos on the topic. It took a lot for me to get my head around the harmonic series and to fully understand the difference between tonal and noise. But looking back on it, I'm super grateful that I spent the time to thoroughly learn it. If you have any specific questions, feel free to join the Discord and ask away in there. Finally, I want you to get comfortable with the four basic waveforms. Learn how they sound, which harmonics they each have, and see if you can pick them out in the music you listen to. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who supported the channel by joining the Patreon, becoming a YouTube member, or checking out the presets on my website. In the next episode, we're going to start learning Vital and putting our knowledge to use. See you then.